James continues tonight, but with 24 hours now passed since the child disappeared, there is growing their concern. Search for two-year-old James at first light. They'd concentrated on the area around an underground reservoir, but gradually widened the hunt to check local railway lines. Friday, February the 12th, 1993. A two-year-old toddler goes missing from a shopping centre in Liverpool. His mother, Denise Bulger, made a tearful appeal for the boy's return. If you've got me baby, to come on back. But James was already dead. His mutilated body was found two days later on the railway line. All I will say to you is that the injuries are absolutely horrific and at some stage since Friday, unfortunately, he'd been in contact with a train. For the first time, Albert Kirby, the officer charged with hunting James's killers, gives an insider's view of the crime. What he discovered about the murderers has challenged his beliefs and changed his life forever. When James Bulger's murderers turned out to be ten-year-old schoolboys, anger and sadness gripped Merseyside. It was a tragedy that would have a dramatic effect on the lives of everyone involved. The case had started simply as a missing child inquiry on the Friday afternoon. A phone call came into the incident room at Marsh Lane Police Station to, to tell us that the body of a child had just been found. It was just after three o'clock on the Sunday afternoon up on the railway lines at the back of the police station. So we, even then, were feeling quite certain that this is going to be James's um, body that's been found. And as soon as Denise saw us, she must have read in our faces um, you know, what had, or something had happened. And she just went hysterical. Um, and screamed out and she was absolutely unconsolable so you feel totally inadequate I think it's the only way you can actually describe it that you feel inadequate you can't do anything for them I hate coming past here um, and if there's another way around I generally do it because I just do not like coming along here because like now we're just approaching here the railway bridge and I know in minute detail what happened on the right and they climbed up onto the embankment and then what happened on the top. I can never really say this is a place I particularly wanted to come back to again and certainly I'm coming back here on such a horrible, wet, miserable day as today is. to be quite honest you know when you come back up here and you look at the cemetery over there but uh, you know, it's quite sad isn't it to come up here and see this you know, quite sad I think it's probably somewhere up here on the on the right hand side yes here we are look at that you know, after all this time, even the, the markings that the scenes of crime officers made as to where the blood was, was, was splattered up on the wall are still there. So you can see the severity of actually the way in which the poor little knight was uh, attacked. Very sad to see that. This is then where James died, you think? Yeah. 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 In that one spot there. <coughs> And you're somewhere up here now, on this other side of the line here, right at the back of the police station, just somewhere in this area here where, we are, where we're standing now, where we're looking here now. That's where his body had been put. And it had been put over the railway line, and his body laid there uh, un until morning when the first train came along this track and actually severed his body in two 
and took the bottom part of the body just that bit further up the railway line. And again, you know, I, I sat here it, and, and, and actually drew it as we went through where his trousers were, where his shoes were, and where his body was, just up that little bit further up the track there. His clothes were, were, were all scattered around here. His little shoes were down here. His underpants were here. His trousers were here. Right there where his body was, there was what it's, um, the railway people call a fish plate, which is... A, a long iron bar, about 20 inches, 28 inches long, and weighs about 28 pounds. And again, we knew that that had been used in some way. Uh, you're on James's skull. What did you think when you first saw it? It, it? it was just so ghastly, you know, to see it. Were you shocked? Yeah, we were shocked. Um, we were all shocked. Doing postmortems on children can be upsetting, particularly if you've got a young family. At that time I had a child who was only slightly older than James. One goes home and sees him and you think back to what had happened to James and you know, you, like all parents, you pray it's never going to happen to one of your children. James had a large number of injuries as a result of being struck by what we interpreted as being bricks and possibly an iron bar. Um, he had uh, bruising above his eyes. He had some split wounds going across the forehead and the bridge of the nose. There's big bruises on the back of the, the head and then the brain was injured as a result of the blows to the head. Obviously the important fact was that I was of the opinion that the death had occurred before he'd been put on the track rather than as a result of the train going over him. I think when I first saw it, my thoughts were, were even up until that stage, that it's some grown-up who's done this, probably somebody like a paedophile who'd found the little boy and take, brought him up here. You know, because you've got to ask the question, why was he to have no clothes on from his waist downwards? Why had he been stripped, his shoes, socks, underpants, everything taken off? So it gave the indication more that it was somebody who, perhaps even for some sexual perversion, had brought him up here and done that to him. When you look around here, you can see the houses. And we knew that some journalists were trying to get into these properties. And there was no way I was going to allow any journalist to take photographs uh, of, a, of a young child's body. Now once the tents were in place over the scene, then I knew that no one could pry. I was frightened that somebody would have had a photograph. And can you imagine if Mrs. Bulger or members of their family had picked up and seen that the next day? It would have been absolutely devastating for them. All people see is James in a the picture. They, they didn't see him play around or talk or laugh or anything like that. All he is to, to other people is just a picture, but to me he's not. He's, he'll always be a person to me. And I'd love to see what he'd look like today and how he'd be today. I can see James and the three of my sons. The way he talks, the way he looks, is there. It's just everything about him. I just try and remember James the way he was and not the way he was taken. And I think that's, that's what's getting me through the days, really. I just try and blank it out. And plus I've got my other three kids now to keep my mind occupied. As soon as Denise reported James missing on the Friday afternoon, Merseyside police launched a massive search. But as they began to comb the area near to the Strand, James lay dying on the railway line. As the night saw Jordan in, I knew that the chances were getting slimmer and slimmer. It was the longest weekend I've ever had in my life. I think I just collapsed the floor, I can't remember much after that. I don't remember the rest of that day long. I just 
sat in a room for weeks and I didn't know really what was going on outside. I was kept away from telly, radios, everything. No one had told me anything. Not that it was a great interest to me anyway. Just I thought I've lost everything anyway, so I don't care what happens now. I suppose I accept now that what happened to poor James will, will probably never go away and will never leave me. It's something that I've probably learnt over the years that I have to live with. Did you cry? I did. I made no bones about it. You know, th there were times when it, it really got to me. You know, perhaps I'm a cold fish and I, I do tend on occasions to keep my feelings to myself. But, on that occasion, I couldn't help it. When you got home that night, what did you say to Sue? Well, one thing I never really do with Sue over all the years is actually discuss the, the details of, of what, what I've seen. You know, I, I tend to use quite glib words to her uh, because I don't think it's right that she should have to relive it with you. Isn't that quite lonely? I suppose it is lonely, really, but uh, I think if you look at my background, it, it's something that I've been used to, uh, of having to deal with, with issues by myself. All Albert told me, really, was that the little boy had been found. Um, so I knew something awful had happened to James, but um, otherwise, no. I think there'll always be details that Albert will keep to himself, but nobody will know. Perhaps even the boys won't remember them. I think there was a lot of feeling for this little boy, that such an awful thing should happen, and it should happen in a busy area. This, this wasn't where he'd run away and fallen in water or been enticed away somewhere else. This was in a, in a busy precinct, which I used when Ian was little because it was safe. The Strand Shopping Centre in Bootle provided the first chilling evidence of what had happened to James. Police uncovered CCTV pictures of James playing outside the butcher's shop. While Denise searched frantically in one part of the Strand, the cameras picked up James and two other boys walking in the opposite direction. James hadn't wandered away. He'd been taken. I knew it was James straight away. It was Albert that took me back up to the Strand and he, he was showing me the footage of him being led away. He asked if that was my son, I said, yeah, it was definitely him. And then Albert knew then it was two young boys that had had him. It wasn't minutes, it was just seconds. Then he reached to get me purse up my bag. It's how quick it happened. I just thought he'd be outside one and around. I didn't in a million years imagine that he'd gone off with two murderers. These are the last clear images of James before his death. As soon as I saw the video footage, I realised that this was going to be a massive story. Because for the very first time, we'd seen a murder live on TV. Not the actual killing, but the fact that the, the, the victim was being led away. And it was obvious what was going to happen, because uh, we all knew the, results, the result was already out. Uh, and that was what made it such an impact. It was almost, it's a terrible thing to say, but it was almost like a made-for-TV murder. Poor James only went missing from his mother for a matter of seconds, and he'd gone and disappeared. Until this person is caught, that the parents must, and I stress this, must keep hold of, of their children. The demands from the news desk were that we get involved and get up to our necks in it and quite rightly because the public reaction 
was so big that we wanted to reflect that and reflect how savage the murder was. All I will say to you is that the injuries are absolutely horrific. At some stage since Friday up until the discovery yesterday, he'd been in contact with the train. The atmosphere was intense, yeah, even at the press conference, and Albert almost broke down. I mean, he didn't because, of course, he's a well-trained policeman, but he could see he was on the edge of, of breaking down. All I will say is it's horrific, and it caused both of us a great deal of emotional upset last night. Security cameras of a construction company overlook a road half a mile from where James was taken from the Strand shopping centre in Bootle last Friday. They had a security system that looked down here and, and towards this roundabout. You could see the very grainy, distorted pictures of two young boys together with another little boy between them walking up here and by this wall. And when I came up here, really, it was then that I was absolutely shocked because I stood here by the wall. You could see where the wall now comes against the back of my leg, whereas on the two boys, it was way up their body. And I then started to realise just how small they were and how young, obviously, they were going to be. I suppose, really, it was something that you're actually fighting against all the time thinking that the two boys that we knew had been in the precinct, the two boys that had taken James away, were at some time going to have abandoned him and for him to have been picked up by an older person. But here, I think we had to accept then that in all probability, the boys that took him were going to be the same two boys that caused his death later on. More than 60 young boys were brought in for questioning. Many were known to have played truant on the day of the murder. Unknown to Albert Kirby, some of the press were following his officers in the hope of being first to report an arrest. The father of, of a young boy who lives in this street contacted us and said that he'd seen his son in the shopping precinct uh, on the day that James actually went missing. His mother was aware that their son had actually committed the murder, that um, when he got home his clothing was dirty and that the clothing had been taken to his grandmother to be washed. So he wove this very tight story which sounded very convincing about how his own son was responsible for the murder and that he wanted to give the information to the police about it. ...from the shopping centre where little James disappeared. There were anxious glances from inside as a crowd gathered and the mood turned angry as police took one youngster away for questioning. The street was just full of people, and all calling maids, it was everything. People in this street had gathered round the house here, um, and they were, they were out really for revenge, they were out for blood really, and it could have been absolutely um, fatal, you know, with the feelings of the crowd around here, and, and, and all around Liverpool. As police tried to keep the situation calm. Made it us and everything, bastards and all that, grown men saying that they were going to kill him. Today, some of the relatives of the Bulger family were among the first to appeal for calm. Us, the family, we're just as enraged as they are. And we just don't want the wrong people to be brought in and charged with this. It's got to be the right people and it's going to take time. We quite very quickly eliminate him from the inquiry. But surprisingly enough, once people get a, a, an idea in the mind, it's, it's very difficult to actually remove it. So the poor family from here that were involved in that, they had to be rehoused and moved elsewhere. I feel very sorry for them because it was totally unnecessary. And what mistakes did you make, do you think? I think the mistake we made really was underestimating the, the fervour of the media uh, to follow the conduct of the inquiry. I think what you've got to do is ensure that the press are a little bit more on board with you than we thought they were. This afternoon, the Merseyside Police Authority discussed the impact that the murder hunters was having on the local community. The Chief Constable, James Sharples, reported that more than 135 youths had been interviewed. We will be interviewing many more juveniles. What we can't have 
is, is crowds attending the premises uh, and perhaps behaving in an intimidating manner towards family and of course to the juvenile concern. Did it put extra pressure on you? It did. It, it did put an awful lot of extra pressure on us uh, because we knew what we were trying to do, what we were trying to achieve, and to get sidetracked for something which, which was totally um, irrelevant, really, it puts increasing pressure on you. I lost a lot of sleep. Sometimes I would just go into a cold sweat and think, what did we go through? What did we live through? How do we come out of this at the other end? It does haunt you then. Tonight we start with new details that have just become available on the case that's been uppermost in all our minds this week. I will start with that security video picture. The Ministry of Defence has employed the same enhancement techniques that were used during the Gulf War. This boy is now fairly recognisable. He's four foot nine inches, he has a roundish face with a small nose and short hair. It's been widely assumed these two are responsible for the little boy's death. But of course we must keep in mind the possibility that they were trying to help him. If you recognise them, please call us. A lady came in and said that she'd seen one of the appeals that I put out on the television and she thought they look remarkably like Thompson and Venables and I know that they're always absconding from school. The police moved in to arrest 10-year-old Robert Thompson and John Venables. We didn't want that repeat of what happened at Snowdrop Street. We were a little bit more careful in the way that we dealt with it. Even neighbours weren't aware that we'd been into their houses and brought them away. It was uh, Robert Thompson that was brought here, because uh, he doesn't live that far away from here. And just at the back of the cells there behind me uh, is the, the, what we would call the juvenile detention room where they were detained. First impressions of Robert were largely related to just his size and how young he was. He stood out uh, in those circumstances, in that environment. A young lad of 10 years of age just seems entirely alien. Robert Thompson was the first to be interviewed by the police. I knew very well I couldn't shout at him. Or raise my voice or be too difficult with the questions. Because he was quite astute to that. He wanted to argue back against me if I gave him a difficult question. So I had a worded sort of um, patronising way. No, you know these video films, don't you? I went too fast here, right? You know these videos, these video cameras? They're the plugged down to the ceiling. Correct. And they look down at everything that goes on in the strand, don't they? You shaking your head, see? Yeah. I know the truth. I believe I, I know the I, truth. I was there. That's right. You waved. Correct, but I know there's a lot of things that have gone on. Yeah, well, do you know it was me that killed them? It wasn't. I never even killed them. <laughs> <laughs> you could easily establish uh, Thompson line because when you gave him a sort of a, a difficult question, his legs would sort of start kicking underneath the chair, especially when he lied and you think, oh, I know this is a sensitive question, so I sort of went down that sort of line and focused every time. Look, once I saw those legs kicking, I thought, oh. That's things that I believe that you did with John no, I never and, to and, baby. and until you tell me the whole truth I can't believe you as the interviews went on um, he made admissions of having been closer and closer and closer to the events of that day always denying taking any part in them but moving from a, a denial of any involvement or any knowledge of them whatsoever to having seen and having been near to certain events. Why would I take flowers over to the baby? I don't, the other I stuff don't know. It's up to you. If to I say. killed him. Well, you were there. Why did you take flowers? You yeah. knew. You knew who did it, didn't you? Yeah. Who? John. Because John hit him in the face. I believe I knew Thompson better than his mother. He played a role of a perfect son. By the second day, of course, 
I believe she had a nervous breakdown. Um, her reaction or her action was such of a person that just couldn't handle the situation. Couldn't believe that she would brought somebody into a world that would kill a two-year-old boy. A few miles away, Lower Lane Police Station was emptied when Robert's school friend, John Venables, was brought in for questioning. No, I don't ever want a brutal strand. Okay. Now, is that the truth or a lie? The truth. But you do understand the importance of telling the truth, don't you? Yeah. Well, I couldn't believe when I first saw John that he could possibly be responsible for anything heinous. There was this little boy, uh, supposedly ten years old, more like an eight-year-old, angelic little face, very polite, very respectful, uh, clearly from a respectable background, his mum was there, very nice lady, and I just thought it was another truanter. There's not, no point in telling lies. <laughs> I never got okay. it anymore. Quite yourself, <laughs> Well, because if I would have said I thought you would have thought I killed him. We had a break and the police also wanted uh, an interval so that they could uh, debrief the other interview that was going on with Thompson at another police station. And uh, we reconvened about two hours later and it was then that it was clear that the two stories weren't matching and it was put to John that Thompson had admitted being in the Strand, which is something that John had denied right the way through the interview. And it was at that point that John said, no, he's lying, it's not true. Then there was silence. And then suddenly he said, yes, we were at the Strand, but honestly, we never grabbed a kid, Mum. Never killed anybody. Well, yeah, we was, but we never saw any kids there. We never robbed any kids. <coughs> So you were in Bootle New Strand? Yeah, was you in Bootle Strand? Yeah, we never got a kid, Mum. We never, we never got Mrs. a kid. Mrs. Venables, would you, uh, I, I, must, I must ask you not to get angry with him. There was a lot of crying and a lot of um, wailing and a lot of hugging. He was a very tactile boy. And as each little bit of truth came out, uh, he'd get out of his chair and he'd hug his mum and he'd hug, he'd hug the police officers and he'd cry. And it was a very emotional time. Did he? <coughs> Did he Go out all the James. I don't know. You don't know? He might have made them follow on behind us. Did he? And then got him lost somewhere. Well, were you with him then? When? With, with John when that happened? No. Robert Thompson always apportioned the, the blame um, on John Venables. Never the instigator in taking him away. Never the instigator in taking him to the canal. Always blaming him and John Venables. And that's how he went all through his interviews. Some of the most damning evidence came from the boy's clothing. The search teams recovered the clothing that Thompson was wearing at the time, which is as shown on the slide now. The most relevant part of the evidence with regard to Thompson came from his shoes. And you can see on the shoes where he's got these little rings and the laces that come in. When James's face was cleaned up, you could see clear marks on his skin, on his face. And I went up to the Forensic Science Laboratory to examine them. We couldn't understand what had caused them. A scientist came into the laboratory from another area and he was invited to look at it. And he immediately said, yes, I can tell you what that is. He said, what's happened there is he said, that poor little boy has been kicked in the face. And not only kicked, he's been kicked with some force. And those lines on James's face, those circular lines, have in fact been caused by the outside right edge of Thompson's shoe. Yeah, when you're saying that um, I've got blood and you That's think right. it's off babe, James? Correct. Yeah, what you think, it's not the truth. What was happening in John Venerable's case is the two detectives found out that John's mother, when he broke down and when he was crying, uh, she was there composing him, and then he'd get his own confidence back um, and then not admit as much. 
Now, when this was pointed out to the mother, the mother, and I think it's tremendously bold on her part, said, well, I want the boy to tell you the truth. I want my son to tell you exactly what had taken place. So she, in fact, got her husband to sit in because he wouldn't give that same type of comfort that she was doing. But the touching thing, really, that happened was when she told John what she was going to do, which was outside the interview room initially, she, he just turned round. She said to him, you know, you've got to tell the truth, you've got to tell the officers what's happened. And she said, never forget, she said, that irrespective of what you've done, she said, me and your father will always support you and will always love you. And with that, you know, he started crying, he broke down, and he said, yes, I did kill James, and will you tell his mummy how sorry I am? A short while ago, as is detailed on your custody record out there, you had a conversation with your mum, and you then requested that myself and Dave Tanner come into the room. Is that right? Yeah. yeah. And what was it you told us? That I killed James. Right. Now, I know that took a lot of doing, and you were very upset, as we all were. Were you shocked? No, oh, I was shocked, very shocked, because, you know, I'm a father. Yeah, I, I've got nephews and nieces, you know, who are, who are in the not too distant past being that age. And you try to relate to them and their behaviour and what had happened here. And it was very hard to make that comparison between the two. It would be many years before Robert Thompson admitted his part in the murder. But John's confessions allowed the police to plot the boy's journey from the time James was taken. Where did you find James? outside the butchers. So we walked up to him and we were walking around with him and I took his hand. Well, whose idea was it to walk towards him? Mine. Was it? What did then it say? was Robert's idea to kill him. And we went outside to the canal. What for? I don't know, he said, let's have thrown in the water. He was persuading him. He said, kneel down and let's look at the water and all that, but he wouldn't. Because when we wouldn't get him down, Robert picked him up and threw him on the floor, and that's where he got his bump on his head. Who took hold of him? Robbie. He was dragging him along the road where the security camera was. Where'd you go with him after that? The, the reservoir where that woman spotted us. Is young James walking with you by this time, or are you still having to pull him? No, he was walking with us. Was he upset, or had he made friends with you? No, he was all nice. He said he wants us more. So what? What did you say to him? What did you say? You. We're going to try and find us, Mum. Where did you leave him then? On the reservoir place. I don't believe you would have left him there. You took him away from where the reservoir is and walked down somewhere else. Where? Going towards the police station. I never killed him. Why had you carried on walking away with him up to the reservoir? Take him up to one of the what were you gonna, why are we taking you up to Walton Village? Don't know, we don't know what to do. You walk along to where? To the train track. The boys had walked James nearly three miles from the shopping centre. Thirty-eight people had seen them. Some had even talked to them. Each time they were asked about James, Robert Thompson and John Venables had lied. I think in the latter part of the journey down here, you can see where there's been so many opportunities for them to have handed James into an adult, or even here, to cross over the road and go to the police station, hand him into the police officers, and for him to be returned to his, his mother. But no, that didn't happen. I think that they premeditated, they knew what they were going to do. And without any excuse at all, they're actually showing 
just how evil they were on that day and how that they'd intended, one way or another, to kill a child. I didn't throw when he bricks, because Robbie said pick up your cup and throw it, I just threw it on the floor. What happened then? I'm running it on the bench. What was it? like a big metal thing that had holes in. A big metal thing with holes in? Where did he hit him with that? In the head. Now which part of the head? Up there. On the top of the head. What was Robert saying while he was doing all this? He was saying, stay down, you stupid dick and all that. Why did he want him to stay down? I don't know. The ones are done dead, probably. Where did the stones in the bar hit him? In the head. And you said the bar knocked him out? Yeah. Onto the railway track. And what happened then? You no. Know, he was just lying there. Is it finished now? Because I can't speak anymore. Usually at the end of any major crime inquiry, there's some form of celebration for a job well done. This time, there was never anything. All people wanted to do was when we'd actually completed the inquiry, we'd got the boys in custody, all they ever wanted to do was to go home to their families and just forget about it. A reading from the book of Revelation. I, John, saw a new heaven and a new earth. Then I heard a loud voice call from the throne. You see this city? Here God lives amongst men. He will make his home amongst them. They shall be his people, and he will be their God. His name is God with them. He will wipe away all tears from their eyes. There will be no more death, and no more mourning or sadness. No, I, 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 I don't think so. Um, I, I don't think he did. When I say raise questions, I, th I think one of the big things that it did do um, were, was made you think, you know, if there is any justice, if there is a God in this world, why the blazes should something like that have to happen? Um, but that didn't last for too long. And I always remember, I don't know if you remember it, the Sunday after that we charged the two boys, I went into church on the Sunday, and um, it was very emotional, really, because Roy, our vicar, the first thing he said, you know, was, was welcome back. You know, into church, wasn't yes. it? It's nice to see you there. Yes. And our friends from church uh, meant a lot to us then, huh? because they kept me going as well. Because, um, for me, it, it, I was so useless, all I could do was look at it the way other people were looking so all I saw about it really was on the television because mm. he was hardly home. I think that by having that faith um, and by going through what we did it enabled me quite easily to realize that these incidents that you've gone to over the years they're exceptional incidents they're not the norm and realizing that you're, you're dealing with the abnormal and that when you're in church and the people who I meet in church they're not subjected to what I what I've been subjected to over the years I don't think it's my role to forgive either of those boys uh, what they did but I, I bear no hatred towards anyone irrespective of their criminal behavior The first boy we'll talk about is Robert Thompson. 
Thompson is one of seven boys in his family. The youngest was six months old, the oldest was 20 years at the time of their arrest. Now, out of those, six of the boys had the same father. The father in that particular case had abandoned the family um, some year, about three or four years before the murder took place. What had happened was he'd been in prison for a long time for very serious crimes that I was involved in the investigation of, and when he came out, he just abandoned the family. Mrs. Thompson was left with nothing then, you know, to care for the family. And sadly, at that time, she, she decided to take solace and drink. And that really ruined her life and put an awful lot more responsibility onto the boys to look after themselves and bring themselves up. Now, John Venables is a completely different child in so much as his background is concerned. He's one of three. Both his brother and sister uh, edu educationally subnormal. But there was never anything with regard to him which indicate that his education was lacking in any way at all. He was always considered, in fact, to potentially to be quite a bright lad. But there was also a lot of evidence that he was a hyperactive lad, that he was very aggressive and that he was fighting. There was an occasion where he tried to strangle another boy with a ruler, which is well recorded and documented. If he was spoken to or if he wanted to seek attention, he'd roll around the walls in the classroom and pull pictures, etc., that were on display. Really bizarre type of behaviour. But also, he'd been the subject of bullying in school, and some of that bullying had been instigated by Thompson himself. Thompson went to the same school as Venables, at a school called St. Mary's Church of England School, and he was not considered to be one of the worst pupils in the school. His, his head teacher said to us when we interviewed her, the pair of them would go together. She knew if one was in trouble, the other one would be there, and that the leader would always be Thompson, followed by Venables. Over the last eight years, psychologists have been trying to understand the boys' relationship in an effort to make sense of what happened that day. They would encourage each other uh, to go that step further and to maintain some uh, feeling of, of, of self-worth in the eyes um, of the other boy. And so that, that would make them do things that potentially uh, were much more um, destructive and much more violent and vicious um, than either of them might have done on their own. I suppose they were cheeky, really, like all of us, were you? Robert was, like, the hard-faced type of boy, like, he just, you know, give cheek back to the teachers when Robert done it, John would do it. Sometimes you'd see them getting over the wall or, you know, going out the gate when the day they happened, they, they got over the wall at dinner time, it was. Staying away from school, being a truant, is often very boring. So they have to invent games and activities and things that they're uh, going to do. Um, the indications are that on that day they thought it would be interesting uh, to pick on a toddler um, and involve that toddler in something that might have been close to some sort of uh, a game that would hurt and abuse a toddler because they had attempted to take a child earlier on in the day. The, the punishment for young people who have been sentenced for a crime is the restriction of their liberty. That's the punishment the court imposes. Um, but clearly it doesn't follow that the environment that young people are in has to be punitive. No. Um, if you simply punish children on a, on a daily basis, they don't learn. They don't learn respect for others. They certainly don't learn respect for themselves. And, and our, it's, it's our job to raise these young people's self-esteem and positive aspects of their behaviour, so that when they leave us, they have alternatives. They have an alternative to the life of crime. Your every movement in the building is monitored and supervised every minute. The only time that you're not monitored and supervised is when you're in your bedroom, and even then, you're monitored every 15 minutes. I think you'll probably be immediately struck by the fact that this young person has a television for young people to, to, to have a television in their room, they have to achieve a very, very high standard behaviour. If this young person's behaviour deteriorates, then this will be removed. Yeah. 
and it, it will take him two to three weeks to get back to this stage. Yeah. But do you think it's an undue criticism when you said it, it's seen it in tabloid mm. press over having these things here? Because you know full well that even where they are, they would have had to have gone through a sustained uh, process to yes. actually earn those privileges. Yes, they would have done. I can't talk specifically about um, Thompson or Venable, but for young people who have been out yeah. of control, um, of authorities for many years yeah. is it's not easy to achieve this. It's very, very easy to lose it. Very easy. I should imagine that some of the children who come in here must get very close to the, your staff, the teachers um, oh, of I, I think who are in here. I think that's inevitable. We have, we have young people who yeah. form significant attachments. Yeah. And, and clearly, you know, we, we are an intensive yeah. unit. I mean, children yeah. are constantly under the supervision of adults yeah. uh, and they very quickly begin to trust those adults around them and develop relationships with them. And that can only be a positive. There are many examples of youngsters being successfully released from secure children's homes who've been detained for long periods of time. In all of the cases, and there's Several thousand cases which I've seen, the chances of them reoffending in a very, very serious way, the sort of repeat offence, are very minimal. The question is, do I have confidence in that system? I do have confidence in that system. Does it mean to say that all cases will succeed? No, of course it doesn't mean that. And uh, can anyone offer any guarantees? Of course not. But um, decisions are made by the, the parole board based on the best available evidence, evidence over many years. I think it has changed my views, um, uh, but I still think that the tariff that was set is inadequate uh, and it should have been um, far greater than it was. Uh, but having said that, during the time that they're in here, I've got no doubt about it, that if all institutions are run in the same way as this one is, at least they're coming out of it, they know they've been punished by the regime that's in there, but at least they've had the opportunity of rebuilding their lives again. What do you think made the difference in your life? I look upon individuals in my life who I can look up to now, you know, who I think were, were really instrumental in formulating who I turned out to be my housemasters at school were men who who were really tremendous people um, who knew how to understand children uh, most of us have had no fathers um, but these men knew how to deal with us in a very firm but sympathetic way they'd made impressions upon me which stayed with me forever in a day in the same way that or that other people had with their parents. So I think although perhaps unfortunate in some ways, I was blessed with having people around me that were very, very good people, very influential people, uh, and people that have helped me in life. Go around the secure unit, that they seem to have that sort of system almost in place, of strong yeah. male figures. Could you see any <laughs> salvation there? No, you asked me the question, I'll tell you. <laughs> yeah, I did. I think I was a wiser man. Uh, I think I was a far more compassionate man at the end of the day uh, than I was at the time. And I've certainly got an awful lot more sympathy uh, towards people's views and feelings than I had prior to the February of 1993.